Hello, pragmaticalists. Chris Potts here. Welcome to the second screencast in our series on Grice's paper, Logic and Conversation. In the previous screencast, I provided some background and context on this paper, and I reviewed some phenomena in pragmatics that, to my deep regret, we won't get to cover in detail in this course. And that was kind of a nudge for final projects in those areas. For this screencast, we're going to jump right to section three of our main handout. This takes us right to the heart of Grice's theory, the maxims of conversation. And in this screencast, I'm going to just try to give you a sense for what these maxims are like and how they work. And then the next screencast, we'll look in detail at each one, focusing on examples that illuminate how the maxims interact with each other to create pragmatic effects. Now, these maxims are absolutely central. And the first note I want to offer about them is that they're a bit unusual in the context of scientific generalization. Indeed, they're much more like contractual obligations or laws of the land than they are like scientific generalizations. If you break a maxim, you don't falsify it. Rather, you just generate some interesting social consequences. For an analogy, consider the speed limit on the highway. If you go faster than the speed limit in your car and you get pulled over by the police, it's just not going to work to say to the officers, yes, I knew it could be done. I went faster than the limit and therefore I have shown it to be a false or incorrect limit. That really won't work. Rather, your violation will, as it were, generate some interesting consequences for you. Compare that with the speed of light. If you go faster than the speed of light, then you've probably falsified some principles of physics. The maxims are different because violating them doesn't falsify them, just like violating a law doesn't falsify the law. And indeed, in an odd twist, it's often in the violations of the maxims that we see the best evidence for them because we get to observe the interesting social consequences. All right, let's move to the theory itself. We begin with the cooperative principle, which is designated as a super maxim. The cooperative principle says, make your contribution as is required, when it is required, by the conversation in which you are engaged. So this is very focused on conversation, and it's defining a very particular kind of communicative cooperation. I think it's really in the spirit of what Grice is saying that people in conversation might be in fundamental disagreement about fundamental things. So they might not really be cooperating with each other, but they might nonetheless want to obey the Gricean cooperative principle. As long as they're genuinely trying to communicate with each other, they'll be expected to abide by this principle and they'll expect others to do so as well. Okay, and then we have four maxims that decompose this principle into some interesting, partially opposing pressures. The maxim of quality says, contribute only what you know to be true. Do not say false things. Do not say things for which you lack evidence. Now, I often mentally paraphrase this as be truthful, but it should always be kept in mind that evidence is an important aspect of quality. It's not enough to be truthful in the sense of not saying false things. You also have to have good evidence for the things you do say. The maximum of quantity, this one regulates the amount of information one conveys, and it has two clauses. Quantity one says make your contribution as informative as is required. So that's like be informative. And quantity two says do not say more than is required, and I suppose that's like don't be too informative. The next maxim is relevance, and it just says make your contribution relevant. So Obviously, we'll want to flesh that out somewhat to make some progress on the question of what counts as relevant and what you need to do to be relevant and what you need to be relevant to and so forth. And the final maxim is the maxim of manner. Whereas the first three maxims govern information content, the maxim of manner governs the forms that we use to convey information. And manner has some subclauses: Avoid obscurity, avoid ambiguity, be brief and be orderly. So that's it. Uh, it's conspicuous to me that there are no pressures to be polite, since being polite is a very fundamental thing for us humans. Politeness is indeed sometimes called the missing maxim, and I'm going to propose later that we sort of add it into this mix. I also want to emphasize that the first three maxims govern information content, whereas manner governs forms. For example, a really long utterance might actually be lacking in information content, and then it would pay a double toll. It would do poorly on be brief, the subclause of manner, and it would do poorly on the first clause of quantity. And conversely, a short utterance could do great on be brief and convey lots of information. 
But perhaps the most fundamental thing to observe here is that we don't, and indeed we can't, obey all these maxims all the time. Some of them are directly in tension, right? For example, short utterances will tend to risk ambiguity, and the pressure to be informative might run up against quality, against the limits of what you have evidence for. So we're going to spend a lot of time studying what happens when there are conflicts of this sort. And to give a framework around that, Grice identified three ways in which we can see these conflicts kind of play out. First, we might encounter a clash between two or more maxims, and then we're faced with a choice of which one to favor. We might opt out of one or more of the maxims. This is a rather blunt way of signaling that one can't or won't be fully cooperative. And finally, we might flout, that is, blatantly fail to fulfill one or more maxims. As usual, these are fuzzy categories that probably have some overlap, and it might be hard or impossible to tell which ones a person did or didn't do with their utterance. But I think these ideas still have a lot of value in helping us to understand the power of the maxims and the effects of violations or compromises of them.